Wait, sure Recording is on. Hi, and thank you for tuning in to the Charles E. Holman Morgellons Disease Foundation's YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jeremy Murphy, and today we are very fortunate to be joined by microbiologist Marianne Middleveen. Hey, Marianne, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well, thank you, Jeremy, and how are you? Uh, okay. Also, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, anytime, definitely. Um, I'm actually doing pretty good. Thanks for asking, my friend. Uh, can you tell us what kind of science you practice and describe how that applies to your work? Well, I'm a microbiologist, as you mentioned, and that's by training and by education. I've worked both in clinical microbiology and in veterinary microbiology. And by my work, I'm assuming you mean my research. I've been involved in Lyme disease research project as a volunteer, and my training and my background has given me understanding and methodology needed to do this kind of work. Oh, that's incredible. What is your extent of your involvement with the Charles Holman Foundation? I have no affiliation or direct involvement with the Charles E. Holman Foundation. I'm not a member of their board. Um, I have applied and received uh, funding from the Charles E. Holman Foundation for various uh, research projects, but I'm formally not affiliated. I'm not involved in their board uh, decisions or any decision making that they do. Um, I've met Cindy Casey and some of the other board members, and I am proud to call them friends, but that's really the extent of my involvement. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Morgellons disease? Uh, what is the diagnostic criteria for the condition? Is it just the fibers under the skin or are there other symptoms specific to the Morgellons condition? Well, we use uh, the presence of unusual fibers in or embedded in or projecting from skin. And that's because that's what we find is the unique feature of Morgellons that is not shared by other conditions. Of course, um, people with Morgellons often have other symptoms like brain fog or fatigue or uh, this or that. And um, those symptoms are very, can be found in other diseases or, or other conditions, um, including Lyme disease. So, um, they would not be unique to Morgellons. Okay. Um, so really the only, the only diagnostic criteria for Morgellons are the fibers. Yes. It's not to say that somebody couldn't have a very similar condition and not have fibers. They might have skin ulcerations associated with Lyme and, you know, there's gray areas. The world is not black and white. We categorize things um, because as humans, we like to classify things. And this helps us organize and helps us diagnose and treat people. But the real world um, is not composed of things that are classified. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. And thank you for the clarification. Um. In 2012, the Centers for Disease Control accomplished a study of Morgellons, uh, but could not determine an infectious agent. Why couldn't they, and how can you, find these pathogens, and what exactly did you find? Okay, um, we found our, our key finding has been that people with Morgellons tend to have uh, some sort of spiroketal infection. Um, we found other pathogens and other pathogens have been um, associated with Morgellons, but in general, the key uh, finding that we have is, is some sort of spiroketal infection, and most often this has been a species of Borrelia. Uh, the reason why the CDC didn't find anything is that they didn't use the correct methodology. Also, when they selected their patient uh, group for study, they did not have used the diagnostic criterion that we did. So patients were not required to have those little filaments. And 
Therefore, we have no way of knowing if they even had real Morgellons patients in their cohort for their study. But also, they they just did not use the correct methodology. They didn't use the they used an, um, they detected antibodies for Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent for Lyme disease. And that's the testing methodology they used for Lyme. And that test they used is very insensitive. So they didn't directly look for the pathogen. And so they may have selected the wrong group of patients and then they used the wrong methodology. Oh, so they didn't really look for the bacteria itself so much as the body's reaction to that bacteria being there. Exactly. They looked for an immunologic response. And in Lyme disease, for various reasons, sometimes people don't make an adequate immune response in order to be called a, a positive. And there's many reasons for this. It could include immunostatus of the patient. It can be due to the fact that these uh, spirochetes sequester in tissues and aren't circulating. Therefore, your body doesn't see them. Um, or your immune system doesn't see them. Also, there's a huge genetic diversity of Borrelia out there, and the test does not encompass all, all the genetic diversity of Borrelia in the real world. Wow. Um, so why does the serologic test for Lyme not reveal bacteria infection in those who it is apparent, like in Morgellons, like in Morgellons patients? That's because one reason the body wouldn't produce the antibodies. Yeah, sometimes it's it's also the way they interpret the the, the test. Some people might make um, a reaction to a few different proteins, but not. They require, for example, um, it to be a class of antibody called IgG. You know, any time past four weeks of infection, they say that an IgG reaction is required. And then they want the patient to be reactive to at least five out of 10 proteins. So if a patient reacts to four proteins, but not five, they're going to be considered a negative. And um, this, the test they used was intended, it was uh, a test that the CDC intended for surveillance purposes, but not diagnostics. But, you know, according to um, different uh, tests or analyses on determining the sensitivity and specificity of that test, it's only about 59% uh, sensitive. So, oh. You know, it's basically like a toss of the dice, whether you're going to get an accurate diagnosis or not. But there's many, many, many different reasons why the test is insensitive. And that includes things like immune status, sequestering of the organism and privilege sites, the fact that there's a great genetic diversity of Borrelia out there that the test is not, um, is not able to detect. And I mean, we could probably spend hours on reasons why that the, the test is inaccurate. Um, also, it's a two-tiered test. So there's a screening test, which is in itself not very sensitive. And then um, the testing involves a confirmatory test. And, and in order to be able to meet, become positive for both those tests, it, most, most patients just aren't. So... Um, it's just not a very good test. And you said that was the uh, field criteria for uh, Lyme. Uh, that's something that was in the news recently that the CDC stated that doctors should not be using to uh, make diagnosis, right? Sorry, could you repeat that? In the news recently, the CDC made a statement that the field criteria for mm -hmm. Lyme disease should not be used in the diagnosis process. Well, I wasn't familiar with that, but, you know, I, I totally agree it shouldn't be. But um, the CDC in the past has recommended that two-tiered test protocol. But um, if they, in fact, have said that, that they don't believe that's a good methodology, that's a step forward. Sure thing. I'll include a link in, to the description below. Mm -hmm. um, 
so your method, can you describe what method you use uh, in your research of Morgellons disease? We use a lot of different methods for detection. Um, we have used serology, which is, you know, basically looking for the immune response, but we also do direct detection of different Borrelia and um, that includes detecting the DNA, and we also do work detecting the antigens, which are chemical components of the organism, and we uh, culture for it, so we grow the organism in, in a test tube from patient samples, and then we later use um, DNA analysis to identify the organisms. So. We also use DNA probes, which they're little probes that uh, target specific sequences um, of, of different organisms um, to, to uh, specific genes that the organism might have. So uh, we don't use just one methodology. We use many, many different methods. And, you know, we try to replicate our work in many different laboratories. So. Um, you know, it, it collectively, we have a lot of uh, evidence that is corroborative. So any one thing you might say, well, that's a false positive. But when you look at our evidence collectively, it makes it very hard to refute. So what you're doing essentially is uh, sending the test specimens to various laboratories uh, across the globe and to accomplish these studies and, of which the evidence will be utilized in your research. That's right. You know, we've done electron microscopy. We, you know, look at culture fluid directly. We've um, sectioned skin and used the DNA probes or uh, specific staining for different antigens. You know, um, and then we've sent specimens, both cultured and um, skin specimens, and look for the DNA directly um, by a method called uh, PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. Oh. And in that methodology, you amplify a specific gene target, and that's how you identify the organism. Oh, fascinating. Um. It gets a little bit too technical, so but suffice it to say, we use a lot of sophisticated molecular techniques to look for these organisms. It really makes it seem like uh, your research it would be hard to uh, disprove with all of the collective evidence that uh, you've been able to accomplish. We also use a lot of controls. And so we get specimens from healthy individuals who have been tested serologically to see if they have any evidence of the disease. And we, you know, compare skin specimens from those people and skin fluid other specimens from those people, you know, with our test subjects. And to date, none of those subjects has had any of these Borrelia or other organisms. Okay. And so that basically means that Morgellons is real and we have the evidence to prove that. It certainly is real. And, and it's not just that we know uh, about the organisms or pathogens that we find in skin specimens and in fluid specimens and, and in other te test methodologies, but we also know from looking at samples where those little filaments come from. You can see that um, that you can see skin cells when you section. And then when you look at the base of attachment, you can see that the, the skin cells go up into the base of that tube, meaning that they are a product of the human skin cells. Wow. And that's that's what more Morgellons really is. Mm -hmm. Um so how strong is the evidence because you've accomplished some research in this regard uh, that Lyme disease is sexually transmissible? Well, there are animal models that show it, uh, that it is possible. And this was a question I had in my mind because a lot of couples seem to be, uh, have, have the infection. 
And in many cases, one person was a couch potato and never went outside and had no history of tick bite and the other person did. So, but uh, there have been conclusive studies in animal models, including mice. And then there was one study at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where they looked at it in dogs and they took uninfected female dogs and bred them with infected male dogs. And they found that the disease was not only transmitted to the females, but also to their, their, the fetuses resulting from the pregnancy from the natural breeding. Oh. Um, this prompted us to look in human genital secretions to see if we could find evidence of the organisms. And we did. But um, I would say that, you know, hypothetically sexual transmission is possible, but have there been any definitive human studies showing that it is? No, there haven't been. But that's partly because we're not allowed to go and do infection studies with human beings. There's a lot of epidemiological evidence and uh, clinical evidence to suggest that it's possible. There's a ethical implication to accomplishing some research? Well, I think it's important because if you, you know, as humans, if we want to uh, try to control an epidemic, you have to understand all means of transmission. And, you know, nobody wants to create panic in people. But right. um, I would say that... Uh, if you're a person in a relationship with another person and you know you have Lyme or they have Lyme, um, it's worthwhile for both parties to get tested. And to be protected. Yeah. Um, is it true? Not, I, I certainly don't want to create alarm or, you know, make people panic over it. Well, there's well more reasons to uh, be protected beyond Lyme disease, admittedly. Yes. I mean, anytime somebody has unprotected sex, you're um, exchanging a lot of different microorganisms. And some are good and some are bad. You, you, you know, it's, you're exchanging um, fluid that contains a lot of different microorganisms. And really, uh, microbiology is in a lot of regards is in its infancy in regards to our understanding of it. That is that is definitely true. Marianne, um, now this was fascinating. Is it true that deer don't get Lyme disease? Well, there's a fraction of blood that's comprised by an immune component that we call complement. And deer complement does not get inactivated by Borrelia burgdorferi infection the way that human complement does. So deer can kill Borrelia in their circulatory system and then therefore they do not get infected. So basically deer are like a food and habitat source for uh, ticks. And sometimes people ask, you know, why can't human complement do the same thing that deer complement does and that's because humans are not deer oh that's true <laughs> yes <laughs> um is it also true that most people who get lyme don't get morgellons but most morgellons patients do get lyme is that true well i would say about six percent of patients who have either a lyme disease diagnosis or who test positive for for the causative agent, about 6% of them seem to, to get Morgellons by different studies. So do all Morgellons people have Lyme disease? I wouldn't go as far as to say all of them because there are closely related um, Borrelia species called the relapsing fever Borrelia. And we found about, you know, half, a lot of people have that Borrelia rather than the Lyme Borrelia. Oh. And um, so really people with Morgellons should get tested for, for both um, of these groups of bacteria. And then um, just about everybody we've tested has had one of those, either relapsing fever or Lyme disease. And um, some people had both uh, had 
more than one infection. They had a relapsing strain and a Lyme strain. And I think it's possible that other spirochetes could be involved in some groups of people. For example, Carl Eckbaum's study group, uh, when he was looking at delusions of parasitosis, and his description was quite, you know, bears a lot of similarity to, to Morgellons. Um, there were three of his study subjects, I believe there were eight in his study, three of those patients had syphilis, and that too is a spirochetal infection. So spirochetal infection of some sort seems to be the key etiologic factor. But there's not just one test for all kinds of spirochetal bacteria. No, unfortunately there's not. So if somebody has Morgellons and uh, they should suspect they have some sort of spirochetal infection and they possibly have other co-infections that are involved. For example, Helicobacter pylori has been found in, in some skin specimens as well as Bartonella. And so there could be, you know, a different constellation of infection or infections in different patients. So really it takes a physician who's willing to, to really um, take a deep look at what people have and identify all the different infections that could be involved. Wow. And, um, you know, that's really necessary to help this group of patients. And a lot of times your average uh, general practitioner isn't uh, knowledgeable entirely to uh, be able to understand how to uh, delve deep into a diagnosis to determine potential infections, but we're working on that, right? We are, but, you know, definitely it's very expensive and some insurance doesn't cover it. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes the best approach might be to do a clinical diagnosis based on whatever symptoms a patient has and then treat accordingly. But finding a physician who's willing to help you it can be extremely difficult for both Lyme patients and for Morgellons patients, or somebody who has, like, say, relapsing fever. This can be extremely difficult to get help when you have a mysterious illness and a strange constellation of symptoms, and especially when those symptoms can be explained by um, other diseases or disease processes. But um, you know, most often if somebody with Morgellons walks into the GPs, they're going to be told they have delusions of parasitosis. Yeah. Unfortunately. Well, a lot of that comes down to their own understanding of the uh, actual Morgellons pathology, right? A patient um, oftentimes maybe hears something on the internet and then starts to believe it, regardless mm -hmm. if your research has disproved it or not. And so that's why we uh, try to have these events so that we can elicit to the public what that uh, research has demonstrated. I've also found that, you know, in, in some instances, a patient might not have Morgellons, but they think they do. And mm -hmm. that could be because occasionally somebody truly does have a delusional belief. But um, for the most part, people who think they have Morgellons really do have it. But there's also patients who have never heard of Morgellons and then they have these strange symptoms. And if they haven't looked in a, a handheld microscope, they don't even know they have these fibers. And we have one physician here in Calgary who a few of his patients had, um, you know, different, uh, one had, uh, cardiac disease, one had a neurological disease, and they also had strange skin um, ulcerations. And he'd sent them to dermatologists who failed to identify anything wrong. And so this doctor had heard about Morgellons. He went back and looked himself and found the filaments. Then he tested those patients for Lyme disease and found, yes, they did have Lyme disease. Wow. So in the right position, this can, you know, help point the way to a diagnosis too. Well, is it true though that some people can actually carry the Lyme pathogen but not get sick? That's definitely true. And um, 
when we were looking at sexual transmission, we had some study subjects who were very sick and um, when their partners were tested, their partners turned out to be zero positive for the, the disease or, you know, they had those, um, they had an immune response to, to the microorganism. So um, often the healthier person has a better immune response and is, is actually um, more easily detected by the serological techniques. So yes, some people can be very healthy and um, yet have that microorganism. They're, in, in general, they just have an immune system that's better cope at coping with the, the microorganism. Uh, Marianne, you did some research uh, down in South American jungles, right? What? Um... Well, I worked in Venezuela and I worked um, both at the Central University in Caracas, which was definitely not in the jungle, but I also worked out in that, did some work in the state of Amazonas and um, what I worked in. Uh, control and treatment of tropical diseases and and identification of, of microorganisms involved in those those processes. Um, did you get to meet any of the indigenous populations that um, uh, still live in their own strange societies? Yes, we worked with a lot of uh, different Amazon and Amazonian Amerindians and. Um, there were quite a few different ethnic groups, um, and one of the groups we worked with were the Yanomami, who had had very little contact with the outside world. Oh, wow. What was your impression of these people? I, I just found, I, I find different cultures really fascinating, and it's, um, I admire their culture greatly, how they can survive in, in such a, um, in their environment and how uniquely adapted their knowledge and their skills are for, for uh, using their environment and um, existing and coexisting with their environment. Um, so I have a lot of passion for them because they get a lot of introduced diseases from the outside world that, you know, they're immunologically virgin. So, you know, a lot of our diseases can kill them. So I, I had always a great deal of compassion for indigenous communities. Is that kind of like how the um, chicken pox wiped out most of the uh, Comanche Indians? Definitely very similar. I mean, that the, in South America, it's estimated that, you know, the populations were far greater than what we have today. And I believe that, that the same is tr holds true for North America. Uh, indigenous pop populations um, in, in North and South America were very adversely affected by the arrival of Europeans and, and our diseases. I think it was smallpox. Uh, my bad. Uh, well, there was smallpox, chickenpox, um, measles, all sorts of diseases. Even the common cold, you know, can kill in indigenous populations that are immunologically virgin. Oh. Different diseases have that effect. And just as well, we become susceptible by entering their environment. Um. I suppose that's true, but to a lesser extent, we've had a far more negative effect on them than they have a had on us. Tragic tale, but hopefully mm -hmm. we can find one sometime in the future. Marianne, is Morgellons associated with mold or fungus? No. Um, it's not to say that a person couldn't have a fungal infection and Morgellons but I have not seen it. So when we look for the causative agent or when we look at causation, we try to look at what 
what is common to, to the whole group, not what is unique to one individual. But I have never seen fungal elements in any Morgellon specimens that I've looked at. And I'm very good at finding fungal elements. The, um, the fibers themselves are not fungal? No, definitely not. If fungi have a very definitive and uh, distinctive cell structure, you know, they have a thicker cell wall, um, their composition, their cell wall composition is different. Um, for one thing, the, their cell structure, you'll find things like um, mitochondria and, <clears throat> and the hyphae. We don't find that in Morgellons fibers. They're, you know, pretty much you can find nuclei and cellular structure at the base of attachment. But when you get into the longer parts of the filament, it's just fibrous material. And, you know, when skin and hair grows, um, the outer layers of the skin, we lose the nuclei. And then in, in the outer layer of the skin, the, the cells are, we just are left with um, fibrous. Oh tissue so we're look we're left with keratin and that's you know what we see in Morgellons fibers we do not see the cellular structure of uh, fungi well now can you explain what a follicular cast is uh, what is it made of and and how do they relate to Morgellons patients well some you know some some Morgellons patients, when they peel off their skin, if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'd see these sort of things that look like, um, they might look like um, icicles or, or you know, they're kind of carrot-shaped things that hang down. And those are really um, likely follicular casts. And follicular casts are really a thickening of the keratin that surrounds a follicle. And they're pretty... They're pretty common in Morgellons skin. They're indicative of defective keratinization. So, you know, something's gone wrong and there's too much keratin produced and um, there's a thickening of that cell layer. Um, inflammation and folliculitis can lead to the formation of uh, follicular casts. So they're, they're not necessarily gelatinous. Uh, Maybe when they're first extracted, they may appear that way, but they harden and get hard because they are, in fact, keratin. And That's right. You know, when when skin is hydrated and you if you peel off skin and it's hydrated, the skin can be quite moist and, and feel kind of jelly like. But if you leave that same skin out um, in the sun, it's going to harden. So can someone someone can have these follicular casts, but not the Morgellons condition? Um. Yes. There's. Um. I would say that you know, if you look at Lyme patients, a lot of Lyme patients have um, various skin disorders. So it can that sort of process could be found in Lyme patients, but there's other conditions that can cause that. So it's possible other infectious agents could cause a condition like that. But anything where there's inflammation to that layer of skin um, could potentially cause that uh, condition. Okay. Well, thank you for clearing that up for us. Um, your latest study demonstrates mixed bacterial biofilms in Morgellons patients. Uh, what are biofilms? So biofilms are complex bacterial communities and they behave, the bacteria in those communities um, behave in a collective manner. And these communities are enclosed in slimy protective um, uh, matrices, are, uh, slimy protective coat of uh, a substance, which um, usually are composed of polysaccharides. Can you give us a sense of scale if like we were the size of a spirochete, uh, how many of us could fit inside one of these biofilm malls or mansions? Gosh, it could be, you know, hundreds, but it could be some of the ones that I see having looked are, are maybe quite a bit fewer. It, you know, it depends. It's, 
it could be hundreds, thousands. It depends on the size of the, the community. It's, it's just like when you uh, look at a Petri dish, um, the colonies that you see can have many or are very, or could be, uh, have fewer, or they're, you know, microscopic. Um, but most of the ones that I see are microscopic that are in Morgellon skin. You need a microscope to see them. Um, but if you uh, go and scrape your teeth and, and you get plaque off, that's actually visible without a microscope. So that might give you some idea of scale. And it no. depends on the microorganism and where the biofilm is and which, you know, which organism is involved. Now, you mentioned plaques. Uh, are the plaques a response by the body to these microbial pathogens or are they actually constructed by them? Well, I am not an expert in, you know, dental plaques, so I'm not going to go to, you know, you'd need to ask somebody about that. But, you know, I don't call, um, you know, what we found in Morgellons, we had, we saw evidence of a biofilm. And, you know, I don't know if the terminology plaque really matches that. But, um, you know, we, we found things like beta amp, well, we, we looked for uh, phosphorylated tau and we looked for amyloid proteins and we saw evidence of amylo amyloidosis um, involved and, and that um, the amyloidosis co-localized with the bacterial communities. But um, in biofilms, these, these sort of um, chemicals might provide a scaffolding um, and we also detected uh, a biofilm marker called alginate. So, you know, I, I would refer to these as biofilm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I did. I was asking more so about the biofilms that you discovered, the plaques hmm. you discovered in your studies and not so much. Yeah. the dental, but I, your would, I would call them, you know, a biofilm or a, uh, uh, bacterial community. They were, you know, definitely clumps of microorganisms composed of, you know, probably in the hundreds of, of microorganisms. Okay. And they can use these plaques as scaffolding, you say, to... Uh, well, they, they might use uh, amyloid proteins or phosphorylated tau. Some of these... Um, self-assembling proteins as scaffolding within that bacterial community. And then the alginate is a, a protective slimy substance that protects the, the community. So they really are like building an actual living environment. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, you know, that, that kind of thing um, protects them from the effects of antibiotics. Antibiotics can't penetrate within that gelatinous um, community very well. So, you know, it's, it's known that biofilms are, um, help uh, bacteria become very resistant to treatment. Okay. And it's a protective type environment. Um, biofilms are often formed in response to adverse conditions. So, um, it's, it's a protective mechanism that bacteria have evolved to have to protect themselves. Wow. Well, uh, now you detected these plaques in the skin, the beta amyloid and the tau uh, and the alginate, but are there other conditions where, all, where these uh, plaques, which are associated with the Alzheimer's condition, mm -hmm. are discovered in other parts of the body? Well, amyloidosis can definitely occur in other parts of the body, but um, I would hesitate to say that we definitely found beta amyloid protein. What we did is we used an antibody to detect that. So the antibody we had was reactive to beta amyloid protein, but we used two different antibodies that were 
were reactive to beta amyloid protein. And only one reacted to those uh, bacterial communities. So, um, you know, we don't know the exact chemical composition of the amyloid protein that we detected using this process. So I can't for, for certain say it was identical to human beta amyloid protein. And antibodies do cross react sometimes. So they might be reactive to more than one protein if the, the proteins have a similar epitope or, you know, the component, chemical mm. component that an antibody reacts to. So, um, you know, I, I would say that we need to find mm. out a lot more about it and we haven't definitively determined the chemical composition of that amyloid protein. And that serologic testing wasn't on an individual, but rather on a, a specimen, a skin specimen. On, on many specimens. So right, we right. selected a group. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we know that, it am, that, that there's a process of amyloidosis in that skin and that, that we know that that amyloidosis um, occurs, it co-localizes or it affects the, the same, those bacterial communities. Wow. Okay. Okay. But, you know, whether it's the same process um, as in, um, I think, you know, you're probably thinking of Alzheimer's disease, which is um, characterized by plaques in the brain and those plaques in the brain uh, are, have, uh, a content of beta amyloid protein and phosphorylated tau. Yeah. Um, we can't say for sure that that is an identical process, what we're seeing in Morgellon skin and in the human brain of people with Alzheimer's disease. You okay. know, I can't say that, you know, we have, we need, we, we don't have that level of understanding to say that it's the same process. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, now in the study, uh, there were actually 14 patients mm -hmm. and um, six of those were selected for the, I'm talking about the bio, the mixed bacterial right. biofilm study. Right. Six of those patients were studied to look for the tau and beta amyloid. Um, mm -hmm. Why, why just those six and not the full 14? Um, those six, we had sufficient um Specimen. So there were some that we had insufficient, like an insufficient amount of specimen. Oh. And also those were ones that were react that in which we found both Helicobacter pylori and Borrelia burgdorferi. So both they, they tested positive for both organisms. Oh, wow. So that was why we selected them. Okay. Um, so we can't really say that it's likely that these individuals who uh, we did discover the tau and beta amyloid antibodies in would ever develop Alzheimer's based on just the evidence that we have accumulated no, so far. We can't really, we can't extrapolate uh, what's happening in human skin to go on to say, yes, the, the same thing or similar thing will happen in the brain. So, um, you know, I, and, and we don't even know that it's the same process. So we definitely can't say that just because there's amyloidosis in the skin that this person is going to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. Okay. I understand. Thank you for clarifying. Mm -hmm. um, some of your research demonstrates the Morgellons condition in dogs and bovine digital dermatitis in cattle. Um, do you, do other animals have more gelons like birds and cats, other domestic pets? Well, what cattle have, a digital dermatitis, is similar to more gelons, but it's not, um, I wouldn't call it more gelons. It's very, it's, it's very, it shows similarity. And in that case, the spiroketal infection that, is detected is primarily different uh, species of uh, treponema. So um, like treponema, tre treponema denticola is, and other genital and oral type um, spirochetes from that genus. 
And however, some of those cattle now um, have had detectable Borrelia infection too. Mm. And in Morgellons, it's sort of the opposite. We primarily find Borrelia spirochetes, but we have found in some patients, we found joint infection with Borrelia and Treponema denticola. So um, it's, it's a very, we see a lot of this same sort of um, a similar process happening in response to the infections. So this is the uh, Treponema denticola is one of the uh, pathogens that's associated with periodontal disease, uh, gingivitis. That's um, and and you're saying that these are associated with bovine digital dermatitis in cattle. Well, there's various ones, but they're they're members of the primarily members of the genus Treponema. And now a lot of the scientists working on that. They believe that although some sort of spiroketal infection is necessary, they believe that a mixed infection is necessary to cause this. Oh. So, I mean, we could find a similar situation in, in human Morgellons. It's premature to know, but we do know that sometimes in we've detected multiple pathogens in some patients. And it could be a different constellation of infections are involved in different people. But, you know, we're in our infancy of understanding the infection. So, you know, we have a lot, um, a lot of learning to do. But we have found a Morgellons type condition in dogs. Oh. They, it, it was pretty much identical to what we saw in humans. And in those dogs, we did detect Borrelia spirochetes. And they did have the unusual blue and red filaments. Yeah, no. Dogs are not deer, so they are actually susceptible to Lyme disease. Yes, they are. Wow. Yeah. Um. So what's you look? You were talking about all these different spirochetes, but what really is the difference between relapsing fever, dental spirochetes, and and Lyme disease? Uh, and how are all three of these associated with the Morgellons condition? Okay. All uh, relapsing fever and treponemes and, um, you know, uh, they, they're they all uh, in the family Spirochetaceae. And they're corkscrew-shaped bacteria called commonly called spirochetes. But Borrelia and treponema are, I mean, again, we're going into human classification of diseases. And classification is a human concept. And, you know, in, in nature, we have a continuum of different microorganisms that are related. Oh. So, um, you know, we have the genus Borrelia, where we have the Lyme bacteria and also the relapsing fever bacteria. And in general, um, the Lyme bacteria group are transmitted by hard body ticks. And in general, uh, the relapsing fever uh, spirochetes are, or Borrelia are transmitted by soft body ticks. And although there are a few relapsing fever uh, Borrelia that are trans also transmitted by hard body ticks, and there's some uh, relapsing fever Borrelia, um, Borrelia, Recurrentus, which is transmitted by a body louse. Oh, wow. So, um, anyway, uh, we have found uh, relapsing fever in Morgellons patients. We've, we've also found um, the Lyme uh, group of uh, Borrelia in Morgellons patients. And in a few patients, we did find Treponema denticola. And, you know, in honesty, we didn't look for all different species of treponema. We looked for just treponema denticola and treponema pallidum, which is the causative agent of um, syphilis. So I guess, so, does that explain it? <laughs> uh, basically, uh, uh, any I'll kind of a spirochetal infection. <laughs> They're all spirochetes, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That does answer my question. 
Uh, but now here's here's something that I'm struggling with. What what is Helicobacter pylori, and do all Morgellons patients have it? I can't go as far as to say all all Morgellons patients have it, but it's a very very common gram negative bacterium, and it's usually found in the digestive tract, and it's associated with gastric ulcers, but. Mm. Um, it's estimated that more than 50% of the world's population carries that organism. So it's extremely common. So if, you know, most uh, Morgellons patients were infected with this, it would not be surprising. And um, Dr. Eva Shapi's group did find that a lot of Morgellons patients seem to have that infection too. Um, uh, whether... In the biofilms that we looked at that were mixed biofilms, it seemed that the Borrelia was located more in the central portion of the biofilm, whereas the Helicobacter was on the periphery of the biofilm. So it could be that the Borrelia infection occurs first, then people from picking their teeth and then scratching their lesion could be introducing the Helicobacter, which then joins the biofilm and, and contributes to the disease. Oh, wow. No, One out of every two people have a Helicobacter pylori infection. And it could be more than that. You know, wow. that's a conservative estimate. But it's extremely, it's it's an extremely common bacterium. Wow. And then there's related Helicobacter too. So, you know, I, I, many, many people have Helicobacter. It's not at all uncommon. And, you know, at this point, we don't know what role it plays. Um, it could be have it, it could be co-involved in many patients. It, it could also uh, be just an exacerbating factor that worsens the condition. And, you know, bottom line is, um, you know, we, we know that there seems that the spiroketal infection seems to be essential and then other bacteria may play some sort of role in the disease process or in the pathology. A lot of people want to know, uh, is Morgellons associated with Bartonella? Well, we have found Bartonella in some of the, the skin samples, but not in all of them. So, between depending on the test methodology that we used to detect Bartonella, about 20 to 30 percent of Morgellons patients seem to have Bartonella Hensley infection. Oh, 20 to 30 percent uh, seem yeah. to have the Bartonella. And, wow. and I mean, we have found it directly in skin of some, uh, we used uh, DNA probes to detect it in skin. So, um, in some patients, it could certainly play a role in Morgellons uh, pathology, but you know it's not it's not found. We haven't found it in. It's not common to the whole group. Gotcha. From our not, find. not not the usual suspect. No, most often it's uh, you know in. In just about every patient we've studied, there's been a detectable spiroketal infection. We haven't always been identified down to the specific level, but we, you know, found either ev some sort of evidence of spiroketal in all the patients we studied. Um, your latest study cites research demonstrating beneficial biofilms uh, producing melanin. Is this suspected of a possible mechanism by which Morgellons fibers are colored? Um, I, I don't know. Um, I just came across that paper and I found it interesting because um, people think that amyloids are all bad. And, you know, for, for amyloidosis is not necessarily a bad function. And um, certainly in microorganisms, it seems to be a normal function for them in some microorganisms, but of course, um, you know, when, when it's beneficial to a microorganism, it might not be beneficial to us. Oh, and we just really don't have everything mapped out yet. No, in science, it, 
it, it's always better to say when you don't know something and we don't know everything. Nobody, nobody does. It doesn't hurt to ask questions. No, there's no such thing as a bad question. <laughs> well, what about, uh, what does blind controlled and peer reviewed mean? And how many labs are replicating your work? How does the scientific process work from where you sit? Well, uh, our studies are blinded and controlled. And that means that when um, we de-identify all the study subjects and we de-identify the controls, and when we submit samples to different labs for various tests, they don't know which sample is the control and they don't know which sample is the test subject. Oh. You know, it's, um, and it's a way of keeping the science honest because um, in some, some cases you could have um, a healthy control that actually has an, the infection you're trying to detect. But there should be, when you're um, doing a blind study, there should be a statistical uh, at least a statistical difference between your control subjects and your study subjects. And so far we have not found these um, pathogens in our healthy controls. Um, the other thing you asked about what does peer review mean? Sure. It, it means that when a study uh, gets published, it goes to other scientists for comment on it. And the other scientists can either accept the paper or reject it. So when it's been peer reviewed, it, it has gone through evaluation and critique by peers. Wow. Oh, is that kind of like a uh, checks and balances to make sure that not just anything is getting through? Exactly. And then we talk also about indexing. A lot of there can be some um, less reputable journals that do so-called peer review that's not very reliable, and usually uh, some of those are not indexed. Indexed, when something's PubMed indexed, PubMed tries to select for indexing more reputable um, uh, journals. Now, sometimes there are journals that are reputable and they're not indexed, but you know, it's it's just another one of these checks and balances. But you also asked about how many labs have replicated our work. That's right. um, get different labs to do different things. For example, we had um, Clemson did our electron microscopy, and then but um, so I'll just give an example as far as detection of Borrelia DNA there have been eight different labs that have performed experiments detecting Borrelia and Morjellan skins. Wow. Skin. You have managed to find Borrelia in, in Morjellan skin specimens. So um, the exact number, I don't know. I'd have to go through all my papers and count everybody and, and count all the labs. But And then there's other uh, labs that I haven't published anything with that have also done some confirmatory testing. For example, Dr. Wymore has also found Borrelia um, and Bartonella in skin samples. Wow, so it's not just one state or one country, really. There's labs all over the world? Yeah, there wow. have been labs um, in North America, in both Canada and the US, and um, also Australia. Oh, cool. Um, well, what's your proudest achievement in regards to your research, Margellans or otherwise? Um, I suppose I'm most proud of what I've done for Margellans because um, that group of patients seem to be uh, treated that the, the the worst of any group of patients I've ever dealt with. And, you know, the, the, the treatment of Morgellons patients by the medical community is particularly heartbreaking. So to be able to show that there is an underlying cause and, and get help for some of these people is extremely rewarding. Wow. Um, and that's very commendable. 
What can people watching at home do to help you produce more answers about Morgellons disease? Well, um, I'll just um, say that people can make donations to the Charles E. Holman Foundation. They fund not only some of my provide have they've provided funding for some of my projects, but they also fund projects for other labs doing the, the work too. And they're an objective uh, group that um, can go through different um, grant proposals and uh, evaluate worthy causes for, for funding research. So uh, there's a number of good people on their board. Cindy Casey's a nurse and Greg Smith is a doctor and they have people with the knowledge and expertise to help evaluate which are worthy, uh, which are projects worthy of funding. Commendable. Um, do you have any personal causes or charities that you are passionate about? Well, aside from Morgellons, um, a lot of the line work I do, I'm pretty passionate about, but um, I'm concerned about uh, various environmental things. So, um, and also I'm passionate about uh, uh, wildlife and domestic, the welfare of wildlife and domestic animals. Because but, you do, uh, and you have advocated for a better treatment for Morgellons patients. Definitely. I think that, you know, that uh, the treatment that I've seen and the stories I hear are really heartbreaking. And it, it's really sad that anybody has to go through treatment like that when you're looking out for compassion and understanding and and care for a mysterious illness to be treated in a, to be ridiculed to be ridiculed by the medical profession is tragic even if they do believe it's it's delusional um to treat people they think are delusional in, in a condescending and um uh, horrible manner is is unprofessional Hmm. Yeah, I couldn't have said it any better, Marianne. Thank you very much for being with us today, for making time for this interview. Well, thank, thank you for uh, granting me the opportunity. Anytime. Uh, you've definitely cleared up a lot of questions we've had about Morgellons disease. Now, uh, hopefully you... I didn't give too much gobbledygook, and it's kind of hard sometimes to explain things in layman's terms. So <laughs> hopefully people will understand. Uh, if you guys like this video, be sure to like, uh, leave a comment down below, subscribe to the Charles E. Holman Foundation on YouTube, and share out with your friends. Marianne, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. You have a good day. You too, my friend. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.